Pat Buttram associated with Jean. But did your paths ever cross with him or your family's paths that you recall? Uh, well, Pat Buttram, you know, years later, as far as just being the best MC in town, <laughs> I, oh, I used to love to go to the events that he was emceeing because he was wonderful. But now Smiley, I knew because of Paradise Cove. He had a trailer up on top of the Mesa, up on the top level of Paradise Cove. And during the summer, he would go up there and he'd have a trailer full of kids. I always thought they were his kids, but now I find out he only adopted two kids. So the rest of them had to be friends of, you know. Mm -hmm. But there were kids all over the place. And Pat would do, or Pat Smiley would do this huge pancake breakfast for all of the kids that were visiting Paradise Cove. Mm -hmm. And so I remember going up there on a Saturday or Sunday morning, just time and again, and, and having pancakes that he'd made. And then his son is the one that taught me how to steal watermelons because there was this big farm up there on that level at the time, huge produce farm. And this guy raised watermelons. And um, I remember going over and getting shot with rock salt out of the guy's scatter gun oh, really? <laughs> a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, he was a farmer that was, you know, raising this to sell, and here are these kids. And wow. Amazing. That's amazing. What was Smiley's personality like off screen? I thought he was great, I, you know, because, well, he was my host. Did he do all the crazy voices and things that he could do? Yeah, he would do some funny stuff and, and do the the frog character and all. But I mean, mainly he was cooking and busy being dad and doing so. Well, I know that was, I mean, those were great pancakes. I We had lots of fun doing that, and we did it you know, several times, so that was fun. Now, what's your favorite Roy Rogers Day Evans movie? Do you have one? You know, it's terrible. My favorite one is Don't Fence Me In because of Gabby's role. Oh, interesting. I mean, his, his doing Wildcat Kelly in that, again, it's one of those scenes that shows the art. He's lying in a coffin. He's dead, lying in this coffin, and in a prior scene, you know that he is allergic to lilies. And this lady comes and puts a whole bouquet of lilies on his chest. And the bad guys are there watching to make sure he's really dead. And so his nose is going and he's trying to, you know, not sneeze. And uh, it's just an incredible scene. But he, he really had a huge part in that whole movie. And I just love it. I, it's a great movie. Um, the two of them together, I think the prettiest that I remember her is from Lights of Old Santa Fe. She is gorgeous in that movie. She's a, a redhead, which is what she was naturally. Mr. Yates was always making her bleach her hair blonde. But boy, when she was a natural redhead, she was just gorgeous. Oh, just gorgeous. And she is so beautiful in that film. Their duet in that film, too, is one of the prettiest songs that they ever sang together. So now let's talk about Gene Autry. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Gene Autry. Anything that you can tell me about him as far as any associations with your that you may have had with him or, or know about or if he ever came over to your house? Or... Well, I, I remember, as I said you know earlier, mainly being over at Lakeside Golf Course mm -hmm. and all and seeing him so many times over there. My husband just recently came across a story that as soon as I, we just moved. Mm -hmm. So when we come across it again, I will make sure sure you get a copy of the magazine that it was in. But I was probably a year, a year and a half. They hadn't had me very long. And um, the article said, you know, what a cute, sweet little girl I was and everything, but that every time that Jean's name would be mentioned, I'd blow a raspberry or do a Bronx cheer. And then it says, but don't get upset because Jean's the one that taught her to do it. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> and I really, I think that's, you know, the kind of relationship and all that they had was, was like that. And um, Gene, we found out doing a rodeo in Fort Worth and then again in Houston. Gene was a huge booster of Dad's career in the early days. Gene had that rodeo company that he started and all, and he put together rodeos around the country. And whenever he would get a request that he didn't fill, uh, my understanding is the first person that he called was Dad, and the first person that he recommended to the people putting it on was Dad. So they worked, I mean, well together, and they really respected each other's talents. Uh, Dad, numerous times over the years, said that he wished that he'd had Gene's business head. But, you know, that wasn't to be. But uh, he always admired and respected him and rooted for the angels, for Gene. And oh, yeah, sure he did. And, you know, when they would get so close to the playoffs, I think Dad would be, you know, down and glum. So uh, that went on, you know, all, I think, all of their lives. Um, Do you remember some of the big events that they participated in together, like the Hollywood Christmas Parade, where they each. You know, the horses, did you go to those? Uh, yeah, and I, golly, we rode as a family in several of the Hollywood parades. But you know, the thing is, it's it's like riding like I do now in the Rose Parade. I have a lot of friends that are in the Rose Parade in different groups. We hardly ever catch sight of each other because, so you know, you're at one end and they're at another end and the staging is forever apart and all. And so those kind of things, you really didn't get to mingle very much. And, um, Did Gene ever give you guys any of like his Christmas records or do you remember that period of, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Or oh, sure. We had that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if Gene gave it to us or if Daddy bought it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think every household had that. <laughs> I can't imagine anybody didn't. Because your, uh, your dad had a code, a cowboy code. Oh, right, writer's rules. How sure. How did the writer's rules come about? It was before me, or at least before I can remember. It was when he started the fan club and all, and I have no idea. I would imagine, knowing Daddy, mm -hmm. that he put it together rather than the president of the fan club or anything, uh, because that was his type of thing. He liked, oh sure, yeah, oh sure. <laughs> he was involved in all of it. I mean, anything that had his name on it, he was involved in it. Is it true that he would bring home the toys that the different manufacturers would want his oh, investment yeah. for you guys to play with to make sure that you liked no. them and they were good? And all Not we guys. Dusty and Sandy. Uh -huh. Dusty and Sandy were the toy test laboratory. Oh, okay. And anything that could survive them for, I forget if it was two or three weeks, if they hadn't busted it up, then Dad would let his name go on it because they were just a demolition team. Yeah. I mean, well, they were two very active little boys. And, uh, yeah, you know. Now, what so, about the Dale Evans outfits, the little girl cowgirl outfits? Did you... Were you a test wearer of those, or, or were you too old at that? Not really. I mean, I I do know of a magazine article that has these fake shaps with Roy Rogers and triggers that I'm actually in. <laughs> but I was the prissiest little girl. I remember at one point, and this is while Mommy was still alive, and Lee Green wasn't the photographer, it was my uncle, Mom, Mommy's brother, came over to photograph this, because I guess they figured if he was photographing it that I wouldn't put up such a fuss. But I was at the point that now my one granddaughter is, I would only wear dresses, and they should be pink. <laughs> and putting on jeans and wearing boys things was just not a happening thing. And so when they tried to get me to do the first of the Roy Rogers blue jeans, I went and I locked myself in the bathroom. <laughs> and I mean, I, I, was, I was tough. <laughs> I can't imagine letting a six-year-old get away with that. But well, I'm surprised they didn't make a little pink cowgirl outfit. You know, now well, again, that was before Dale, by the time, you know, 
Yeah. And by the time that she was doing that, I was almost her height uh -huh. before the Dale Evans stuff came out. Because I had my full height when, on my 10th birthday. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I grew really quick and then never grew anymore. Wow. But, uh, yeah, so I, I escaped that. So... In talking about your parents in the future now, the mm -hmm. future, how do you, what do you want to do to carry on their legacy? What, what are you looking forward to doing? What are you doing? Well, um, I wrote a book mm -hmm. called Cowboy Princess, Life with My Parents, because I wanted people to see more of them, not just the Roy and Dale that you saw on screen or in your home, um, but just the incredible people that they were, the musicians that they were. I So gifted and so talented and hardly anybody remembered that side of them um, or even knew that that mom had written all those songs, 72 songs in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And then after she passed away, we found a few more that she hadn't even sent in. Um, they were funny. And I think that's what, be, between the music and the sense of humor is why they were married over 50 years. It, it kept her from killing him <laughs> because he was really mischievous. And I mean, in the early days of their marriage, he'd show up for dinner with 40 people or something, you know, and just assume that she would take care of it, which she did. But I wanted people to see that side of them together and um, realize that they weren't just the people that you saw on the screen. So I did that and I go to a lot of Western festivals and film festivals. My husband Larry is right there with me and we do everything we can, you know, to keep the name going and keep it out there in front of the public. And um, I was one of three authors of a new cookbook, The All-American Cowboy Grill, that we have Gene Autry recipes in, thanks to Maxine and Carla, yeah. And I just, the Western genre people are so wonderful. They are warm, they're supportive. Uh, we love going around the country and, and meeting new people and hearing the Roy and Dale stories about how they got to meet him just, you know, just before he died, or they missed him by five minutes, or they met mom once on a plane and she changed their outlook on life. And I don't know how many stories I've heard like that. And then now the adult policemen and firemen and ministers and teachers who, because they'd lost their dad, that dad was their surrogate father and the person that they looked up to. And it was because of him that they stayed on the straight and narrow and, you know, wanted to contribute and make something of their lives. And I, I never hear too many of those stories. I mean, to me, that's just so incredible that they've had that kind of an impact on six generations already. I mean, you know, they were in show business forever. All over the country. With sure, everywhere. Well, and all over the world. Yeah. Shortly before Daddy passed away, I was in the museum. Dad was in the back room, and he was really tired. He didn't have much stamina then, and Larry was getting ready to take him home, and he came into the office and said, you know, bye, honey. I'm taking your dad back to the house, and this bus had just pulled up, and these people were coming in the door of the museum and I'm listening to this language and Larry says what is it I said I I don't know but I think it's Russian and he says well I, I wonder because we were always looking for something to pick daddy up and keep his interest going and he said I wonder if your dad you know, would like to see them. So he went back and he asked dad and um, dad says, well, you know, I've always wondered if my Westerns were seen there. <laughs> so he gets the Roy hat back on and he gets on trigger three, his electric trigger, and he goes out and it's like the parting of the seas. And these people are standing, the Roy Rogers? I mean, they just couldn't believe, you know, and applauded him. And I mean, it just was so incredible. And this one guy kept looking at Larry and he says, the Roy Rogers? No. 
the Roy Rogers? No. Yeah, I mean, he just, oh my God. yeah, I mean, it just, was it was, it was. And that museum, know, you know, thing. the museum that daddy put together, I mean, Again, he, he loved Will Rogers. That's where dad took his name from. He met Will Rogers the day before Will Rogers left for Alaska. And when the studio asked him what he wanted for his name, he said he didn't care about the first name, but he wanted Rogers to be the last name. And he when he was still part of the Sons of the Pioneers and they were traveling around, he went to a museum in Oklahoma that was really tiny at that time and had very few Will Rogers things in and dad was sort of disappointed. So he said that right then and there he made a promise to himself that if he ever made it, he would keep everything and he would have a museum. And, you know, we teased him about it. Mother really gave him grief over it because she tended to throw things away. And now we're, we're so happy that he did that because it kept him going for a good probably 10, 15 years longer than he would have otherwise. He went in there every day that he felt up to it, every morning, and... It was so heartening to him to have these people come up to him and tell them their stories. And I mean, how could you help but respond? And it would give him such a boost and it gave him a reason to keep going. Mm -hmm. It was just super. So years from now, let's say it's 200, 300 years from now, our great, 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 (laughs) whatever. and they look at this tape. Mm-hmm. Is there something that you would like to communicate to those people about your parents, about Roy and Dale? Um, yeah, they were wonderful entertainers who loved what they did, couldn't believe they got paid to do what they did, had done it for free many, many times, who really loved the people that they were entertaining were really interested in them and and what they did and appreciated so much the audience's appreciation of their efforts. And I don't think they ever took it for granted. I mean, I don't remember, I mean, they weren't rude to their audiences. One time, Dad in England got a little testy because the crowd tore the fringe off this suit. (laughs) They got a little too close, (laughs) up close and personal. But, I mean, they appreciated so much the opportunities that they were given and the longevity of their careers. My dad with the museum was, you know, he's still in there two weeks before he died. Mom did her show up till six weeks before she died. And it was because the audience had taken them to their hearts and just welcomed them into their families and all. And I think TV had so much to do with that because TV, you grew up with them and you felt like they were a part of your family when they came into your living room. And I, I'm sure that entertainers before weren't given that kind of chance. But mom and dad, the timing was just perfect. And they were really warm, genuine people that you could embrace. Thank you. Thank you. This is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. This is just